an important component to motor behavior, motor control, human motion analysis is, is really how we identify measurement. And, and what we're going to look at in, in particular, too, is some of the ideas with measurement error um, and ways that we're going to discuss um, some of these studies in this class. So here. So this next group of uh, topics is really something you should have gone over in any research methodology course that you've talked about. And we'll talk about the differences between reliability and validity. And then, but most importantly, we're going to start with this thing called objectivity. And if you've ever spent time with me in the lab or, or around my world, you know that a, a objective measures and analysis of human motion to me is kind of important. And um, in a world today, and, and many of you are going to go to physical therapy or occupational therapy or, or athletic training, where you do a lot of subjective measures. And, and it's not a bad thing, and I'm not trying to knock against subjectivity. And the, and the reason why these subjective measures are there and these clinical measures are there is really because it allows for a quick assessment, right? But they rely heavily and deeply on the skill level of the clinician doing the assessment where objectivity of these measures relies less on the, the skill level of whoever's doing the analysis and the researcher and the clinician and allows some sort of um, practice or, or um, technology to help us make those measures. And so think about like the gymnast or a diver um, and these judges that sit there and they'll hold up a scorecard that's a very subjective measure. And it would be much longer in the process if we had to do some sort of very objective kind of calculated component, right? And then think about if you are a baseball fan, the debate these days is whether or not there should be instant replay or, or whether or not a computer simulation or a computer should be do, determining balls and strikes as opposed to a very subjective umpire behind the plate who doesn't can't really see what the ball's doing when it travels at 95 miles an hour crossing the plate. Um, and so... The, the, I'm one that thinks that in those situations that maybe having this objective measure could be good because that, what that does is from umpire to umpire, from day to day, from first inning to ninth inning, that means the balls and strikes should be called the exact same way, right? So these are two observers that would call it the same way, where in a subjective measure we have two observers that might rate it differently, okay? And the other component of objectivity is this concept of sensitivity, and that is can how well are you able to determine um, skill level between two athletes or between two levels of athletes based on this value, okay? Um, and so that's really a component of sensitivity. And But also, are you truly measuring what you have designed to measure, right? So when we think about a high jump, are we truly measuring how high somebody can jump or are we measuring the skill it takes to get over a bar at a certain height? And that's actually what we're doing, right? So the bar is set at a certain height. And more importantly, the dip in the bar is set at a certain height. So if you are more skilled then you know how to approach the bar to get over the bar at the lowest spot, but you also know how to move and pattern your motion to clear the bar. So a lot of times it's not that I can get my center of mass the highest off the ground, but it's more importantly that I can move in such a pattern in such a way that I can clear the bar at the given height. So I just have to clear the bar. I don't have to jump as high as I can. Um, and you'll see that as through the process goes, right? The next component we're going to talk about is reliability, and that is can this measure or can this um, test or can this um, activity be performed the same way in the same conditions? Can we measure that idea in that task in the same way, right? So this idea that um, if the conditions are correct, can we do the same thing? And a lot of this, think about the timing, right? Um, and what you'll, this is one of the things I talk about. So. Racing is, is in marathon running and things like that, and world records for marathon running are given on just a temporal component, but there are many things, right? So some races are known to be um, BPs or, or, sorry, BQs or Boston qualifiers or Olympic qualifiers, right? Because they are speed, they're, they're not as hilly. Um, so you're gonna travel those. Um, but every race is not equal um, because there's different elevations, there's different, um, altitudes and so knowing what your body is best at may you may be better suited for certain things um, and then also um, sometimes if you run the fastest known time you're not going to be able to do it because there's a tailwind and so they take that out so the idea is that yeah the the, the measurement is time and distance um, but 
it's really they take into account how much elevation, altitude, and how much wind is going. But so reliability is simply that can we measure the same um, under the same kind of conditions and understanding that there is some inter-individual variation and, and some changes in your internal state, but can it measure the same under the same conditions? Then you have validity, right? And so this is, um, does that test actually measure what it's testing for, right? And so the idea with the validity is, is oftentimes, and a lot of these going back to the clinical um, tests that we do, there are ways that we can measure that it actually measures what it says it's going to measure. And we do that with this wearable technology stuff that's coming out as well, is we'll take it and measure it against the gold standard. And so that's, you'll see that. Um, but construct validity, does it actually reflect the construct it was supposed to? And so that's another thing you're going to go through during the process of thinking about these theories and ideas presented in this class is, does it actually measure what it's supposed to do? Or does it reflect the idea behind what it's supposed to? Now, there are a couple measurement approaches that we come through, and one is the outcome, and you see that as made shots versus um, did I make a bullseye, and that is the outcome of the measurement. And then you have things where I do on a regular basis in the biomechanics lab, but we assess the movement. We want to know what the joints are doing, the pattern of motion going forward. And then you have ideas of the CNS process, and you go back up to the brain and look at the extra activities in the, in the brain and the EMG activity in this in the peripheral and you can see what's happening with that central nervous process. As we go down and break in a little further, um, oftentimes you're going to hear mostly about outcome measures and that's um, in, in, in a lot of different sports out there we look at the outcome and right and it's the achievement of the desired task or goal and did you pr did you produce what you sought out to produce did you make the goal did you make the shot did you spike the ball did all those type of things right did you clear the high jump and, and so basically, um, it's concerned in the relationship of the object or performer in whatever environment they're in. Did I make the golf ball in the, in the hole? Oftentimes, there are, there are many ways we measure environmental goals. And um, error is one. Um, time and speed, how long it took us or how fast we were going. The movement magnitudes, how big was it? Um, how high did I jump? How far did I jump? And then we also look at a performance of a secondary task to see um, how those movement outcome goals were. So the idea is, is how do we measure these performances, right? So what is the measurement error? And, and this is what we're going to spend some time talking about here is there's many ways um, if we don't achieve our desired task and how we can talk about it or how we can score this. And it's very important going forward as we're going to begin to look at some um, research that you understand really what they're doing, right? So if my goal here is, uh, is 100, and each of these X's, you have one, two, three, four, five, and the subscript one number is talking about the shot that they did. And think about this was the idea was um, that something was traveling down a line to up to 100 and you wanted to stop it. And, and you stopped it first time at 93 and you let it go a little longer and it was 103. Then you went a little quicker, 99. And so this tells you the score that what it was. And then here's another example, right? So if I'm trying to play... If I'm playing darts or, or I'm shooting at some sort of target, um, maybe I'm at a, at a driving range or, or um, a gun range or, or I'm playing, doing archery or the new thing is um, the axe throwing, right? So it, you have marksman A and marksman B, and each of these holes represents the shot. Um, would you say that marksman A is more accurate or marksman B? Or do you, do you say that... Um, you know, who do you think of these two, would it be easier to change something with, right? So for me, marksman A is very variable in their movement. Marksman B is not very variable. They're very consistent in their motion. Um, so there may be something in marksman B that they're just missing, right? Maybe there's some wind and they just need to account for the wind. Maybe their aim is just off, but marksman A is very much more variable, right? But they also hit the bullseye a couple times. So, so this is that idea that you take into account what the goal or what the target is and then where the person is and how do we talk about that. So as we go forward, here are a couple of things we're going to do. So um, now you're going to, we're going to talk about five different errors, right, and, and what that measures. And, and the first is going to be constant error. Now, when we do this, what I do not want you to do is waste any time 
trying to memorize these equations. I'm not going to ask you what the equation is. Now, what you might want to do, though, is understand what the variables are within the equation, because that's going to help you kind of understand what it is. And in this, the T, the capital T in this constant error is the target, right? So did the constant error is the average error in the outcome. And one of the important things for this is in the, during constant error, you're going to need to keep the positive and negative because that's going to give you the direction and the magnitude, right? So you're going to be able to do north and south or too high and too low or in the positive and the negative, too long, too short, and that's what you can get. And what this does is it shows the, the bias um, in your true score, right? So it tells you, am I more likely um, to shoot long or am I more likely to, to shoot short or am I more likely to shoot right or left and it tells you where your bias lies now what this doesn't do is give you any idea in the scatter of the variability or the inconsistency within your range right so if you think back to the previous marksman um, if we looked at the constant error marksman a had less constant error um, but we don't know the scatter of the variability or the inconsistency with their shots. They were much more scattered and variable than Marksman B, but Marksman B was, on average, much further away to the bottom right um, of the target. Than, um, so we would say that Marksman B had a higher constant error, and their constant error was probably negative to the right. So the next one we have is this thing called variable error. And if you're going to look at the equations, the major difference here, A, without the square root, is the, let the M the it replaces the T. And the M here is the individual um, person's mean. So it doesn't take anything into account with the target. It talks about the mean scores, right? So if we go back to that beginning one, and we talk about um, marksman B was less variable. So they had less variable error, meaning that their shots were all closer to their mean score than marksman A. So marksman A had an increased variability, right? So variable error talks about how variable or inconsistent it was. So with a smaller variable error, so the individual is less variable or more consistent, right? So let's go back to what marksman A and marksman B look like. And, and so if I circle around um, both of their scores, you can see the size of the circle talks about the variability, right? And so that's the variable error. And you can see the diameter of these. Yeah, marksman A is not drawn perfectly, but you can see that kind of the illustration there. And then what we do is if we're talking about the constant error, we're going to take whatever all the average distance from this target is right so this one is a if we were doing a coordinate system it would be a plus negative right plus this way and negative this way would be where they're at if we took the average um, kind of distance away from the target over here um, uh, we'd probably say it was someplace um, around over here maybe I guess um, and so look how much that that distance is much different and it's a positive positive so we can see where this looks like right so marksman a has a decreased constant error relative to marksman B, but marksman A has an increased variable error relative to marksman B. So if we looked at this, we would say that marksman B is much more uh, consistent in its pattern. However, its um, average shot is much further away in a negative po or a positive negative direction than marksman A, which is a positive positive bias, right? So these um, remember constant error represents the bias of their shots. So the next component too is just total variability represented by this E up in the corner. And again, now we come back to, we bring in the target. Now this time though, what we do is square it. So what that square does is it actually removes any positive or negative, right? So now we don't know where they are relative, but it's just the overall error because it's the room in squared error. So this is another thing that's gonna come up in, in a little bit later is understanding that this root mean squared error is a way of discussing total variability. And if we go back up to here in this equation, E, which is total variability, remember variable error and constant error. So another way to think about this is just squaring the two errors from previously, okay? Um, but this is overall measure of how successful the target was hit. And again, this is not any component of positive or negative. So you don't know where the direction of it was. Then you have the idea of absolute error again. And now this also takes about any deviation of the outcome um, or 
um, the actual direction of which it is, but this is just the overall accuracy. So when we talk about absolute error, we're talking about the overall accuracy of the component. And then we have the absolute constant error, and this is a measure of, of just accuracy and how accurate. And, and this talks about the bias without regard for its any directions. It removes any of the mean effect of the positive negative because it is these just basically that constant error from the before, and it takes the absolute. So if you look at all these, these are all kind of components where it doesn't really show you um, where relative to the target the it was come. Um, the biases or where the shots were, um, but the total variability is just the overall error, error in the outcome. Um, the overall accuracy is represented by the absolute error, and the measurement of accuracy is just the absolute constant error, right? So these are all different ways of talking about um, how accurate or where the bias lies. Um, one, one of the things we want to talk about, too, is just how do we understand this error, right? And so we're going to come up with some measures, and, and this is just a slide. I don't spend too much time here, but it's just an idea of if you have a CE large in either direction, and if we think about what that represents, right, that means the measures of overall error are the bias in the score, okay? If you have a small CE, the measures of overall error, um, and then that means that the variability is in the score, okay? Now, if there's an intermediate, that means there's some bias on both sides of the scale. So that means you have an unknown combo of bias and variability within it. Um, and so just understand that going forward, that that's what some of the things are going to be looking at. But again, don't spend too much time with this slide. So we'll just go for it. Going forward, let's talk a little bit about the accuracy task. And these are all different kind of components of um, time on the target and tracking tasks. And I want to draw your attention down here at the bottom to the idea of the root mean squared. Um, and this is really the measurement of error. Um, between the performance and the goal, right? So it's the idea of um, the outcome versus what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and if we go forward, um, these are all different components, pursuit tracking, experimental matching, two-headed follow point and balance. So these are all different ways that we can measure how much time on target between the stabilometer, the pursuit rotator. Um, and then it's all gonna be measured by this root mean squared error on how well you achieve the desired task. Um, so this root mean squared error going a little bit before represents the area between the performance and the goal. So if you look down here, the dark um, or the bold, if you look at this, the bold is the track. So what you're trying to track, um, the subject response is the other one. And so the root mean squared is simply calculating this area underneath. So if I had a larger area or a larger root mean squared, then that means I did a, a more poor job or I was worse at my tracking task. If I had a, a root mean squared error that was less, then I did a better job at my performance. So that is how we're gonna utilize root mean squared going forward. So just understand that it's a measure of how well I did during these tracking tasks. Um, this is a stabilometer. Um, this is Dr. Wolf, and she's actually at UNLV and who I, I learned from, um, from a motor behavior perspective. Um, and you'll hear quite a bit about her later on as we talk about attentional focus. But this is a stabilometer. It's a scheme simulator um, that you go back and forth one, and it uh, measures the magnitude and how far down to the side you can go and how smooth you can go. As somebody is a novice learning this task, they tend to stay right here up at top. And so the magnitude is how the deviation you have from the center, and as you get more experienced and better, you have a larger magnitude of sway back and forth. And then we have this idea of performance of a secondary task on the primary task, and this is used to, to see how well learned or um, how taxing the motor system is on, um, on one skill versus the other. So if a squill, and you'll learn this um, from when we start talking about motivation or attention, um, and sometimes a task takes away from another task, therefore it requires attention, right? So um, this will be as going through driving and how we know that um, texting while driving or talking or eating or doing some other stuff while driving is actually requires attention, distracts from what we just talked about. So it's that idea of there's a trade-off from one task for the other one to be performance well. Um, so this is that idea of, of a driving mental load and, and going forward. And um, 
whether you're in a rural, whether you're a highway, urban, or a city, and how well you can do. And, and, and what you'll see a lot from this too is, is we'll talk about these digit recall tasks. Um, and so what a digit recall task is, is they'll give you a, a series of digits, have you do something else, um, and then and measure um, the effect of that digit recall on the other task you're doing. So um, that is just a huge couple different components that we're talking about. And here we have the Z-score that we're gonna use Going forward, when we talked about the kind of kinematics piece of, of the movement duration and, and how to analyze motion, it really comes back to, to this movie bridge and, and the idea that we can utilize film um, to analyze human and animal locomotion. And there's a whole series that I actually have the book in my office of Edward Muirbridge and, and what his images are and, and how human motion. And actually, this is where originally they found that the horses do have um, four different moves, a gallop, a trot, um, and I don't even know the other, other two offhand, but the idea that um, we can literally sit there and talk about joint angles in motion and then how we can quantify it from a kinematic perspective. Um, and here we have um, describing the limbs, and this is that kinematic post perspective we were talking a little bit about earlier, too, um, and the position velocity acceleration relationship that you've seen. Um, if you take me with biomechanics or, or if you looked at any biomechanical component or mechanics going forward. Um, but this is a, a measure of movement during the process. Not, this is not an outcome, but this is during um, the actual constructor or um, completion of the movement task and more relations to the human body. And then we'll get to later on in the class, and this is um, kind of a coordination piece of the class, and um, you have the right finger, left finger, and, and how they're moving up and down and tapping together, and, and we'll talk about coordination and, and the movement patterns as they relate more and, and later on in the course. Uh, but this is really an introduction to it and how your left and right fingers can and be in coordination up and up and down, down to each other. And so we'll, you don't need to know this yet, but so the end phase means that they are tapping when they're supposed to and up when they want. This one talks about left and right finger antiphase, so they're doing the opposite components. When the right finger is up, the left finger is down, or tapping, and that's antiphase, so they're doing the opposite. And we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about that tapping motion later on. Um, and here we go, just another way of talking about motion and um, in uh, kind of a coordination component. On the right-hand side, you have a position velocity curve, and this is the uh, called a phase um, plot. And from that, we calculate the phase angle, and you'll talk about that later on in the class again with coordination.